also bring the remaining parts of Mohammed's speech. After that, we'll be speaking to the key functionaries of the NDC to give the, the initial highs and the program has gone. It's going to be an extended night. Stay with us. My name is Bernard Avile. Don't forget the point of view is brought to you by Airtel Tigo. So let's get back in there as the NDC running mate continues their presentation on the human development pillar of the NDC manifesto. The challenges that tertiary students face, and of course those of their families and their friends too. And this informs our agenda for the nation's universities and their students. First, please let me reiterate that we are unequivocally and unashamedly opposed to the public university bill. It is a weak attempt to introduce political control over our universities and to erode academic freedom and institutional autonomy. As we, and we stand with the faculty and leadership of our public universities in opposing this grotesque overreach. We know how COVID-19 has impacted an already weak economy and personal finances. And we must not let, let this become another barrier to opportunity. That is why the next NDC Gov administration will absorb 50% of fees for tertiary students for the 2020-2021 academic year as an incentive to mitigate the, the effects of COVID-19 on students and their families. As a long-term investment in financial access beyond the recovery, we intend to increase the student loan amounts to, make, to be commensurate with prevailing educational costs. We will restore the, the Student Loan Plus initiative that we created which takes care of newly admitted students who are facing financial difficulty even in paying the admission fees. These loan repayments will only begin when beneficiaries gain employment after school. We also recognize that many inequities that virtual learning during this, uh, this pandemic has laid bare. So we will provide free laptops to tertiary students to facilitate participation in online classes. We will also establish free Wi-Fi zones in all public and private tertiary institutions. His Excellency has already talked about the establishment of new universities. Our commitment to increasing access to education is at the heart of our free TVET policy. It is a plan to provide the free technical and vocational education at the secondary and tertiary levels. We will complement this with a program for the establishment of an ultra molding and fit for purpose technical institutes in our regions, in the regions that do not have any. And to maximize early career opportunities, we will also implement a national apprenticeship program and a national internship program. We shall address head on the problem of examination mal malpractices and restore the credibility and sanctity of examinations conducted by WIEC. Quality education also depends on having good teachers, well-trained teachers, and having enough of them. So we will abolish the mandatory national service and teacher licensure examination for graduate teachers. And we will restore the automatic employment of newly trained teachers to improve the teacher-student ratio across the country whilst we consider those who have studied via distance. Now healthcare. 
We have a plan for better health care and improved public health. We in the NDC believe that quality, affordable treatment should not be determined by where you live or how much money you earn. These barriers to cost and distance continue to exclude millions of Ghanaians from care, from care that they need, causing them to delay seeking care or to forego it altogether. This is why the next NDC government is going to institute the free primary health care and I think this will be well articulated by our flag bearer. But access to primary care is not, it's just one piece of the puzzle. We need to build more clinics, as he has said, train more people in diverse healthcare delivery. To maximize the reach of our healthcare system, we will redeploy the abandoned Oniadro mobile clinic vans to take healthcare to the underserved and to the hard-to-reach communities. And we will build and introduce the, Onia, the Onipe Nia hospital ship to provide medical services to riverine and fishing communities along the Volta River that are inaccessible by road. Chronic illnesses are killing more and more Ghanaians, and they are killing them younger and younger. And it is adding insult to injury when health care costs make it difficult for them to get the treatments and medication they need to stay alive. So we will establish a cancer and kidney trust fund to support Ghanaians who need assistance for such conditions. <laughs> to focus our attention on the grave risks that non-communicable diseases pose, we will also declare renal failure, diabetes, hypertension, and national health emergency. This will allow for an unprecedented investment towards providing better access to affordable treatment for persons suffering from these illnesses and who cannot afford to pay for them. Much of the cost of health care is determined by cost of medications. We will introduce a policy of framework contracting for, for pharmaceuticals in order to lower the cost of drugs in our health system. And we will empower the local pharmaceutical industry to produce more generics to feed the domestic drug market as we, be, as we started in our last administration. Of course, we will also look to our own indigenous knowledge systems for alternatives in order, and we will we'll do this by collaborating with traditional herbal medicine producers for rapid integration of herbal medicine in Ghana's systems. But a healthcare system is only as good as the healthcare workers within it. How many they are, how diverse they are, how well trained they are. So we'll employ qualified health professionals in search of work. We will train more personnel in domiciliary and palliative care to address the health care of the elderly and the sick. We will establish and in initiate a plan for the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. And in honor of an African giant, we will establish the Professor Jacob Plant Rule Endowment Fund for medical and surgical specialist training. A good healthcare system needs guardrails. We are at our most vulnerable when we are in need of care and must be able to trust healthcare workers to act professionally to keep us safe and to respect our dignity. So in the interest of accountability, we plan to establish a Patients Protection Council to fully implement Patients' Rights Charter. But when healthcare workers distinguish themselves through excellence or sacrifice, that should be acknowledged and rewarded too. The next NDC government will institute a National Health Workers' Day and establish an award scheme to deserving practitioners and facilities. And we will extend this to private 
to the private sector as well. But our health system must also be responsive to new realities. The perils of COVID-19 have shown the value of capital investment in health infrastructure. And no fair-minded person can ignore how critical the University of Ghana Medical School, the Gar East Hospital, the Bank Hospital, and many others have been to Ghana's efforts in this pandemic. And kudos to our incoming president. While we cannot predict the next pandemic, we must be prepared. The lessons from COVID-19 are that a reactionary response will hamper our ability to contain the situation, and that has terrible consequences for our lives and for our livelihoods. So we must be proactive. We must conduct and we will conduct a thorough study of our public health and clinical response to COVID-19. We will review the economic incentives and reliefs to understand who really benefited from them. And we will conduct a value for money audit on procurement and spending during this pandemic, including pricing and availability of tests, protective equipment, and medications. We will make those findings public in the spirit of transparency and accountability. And those lessons will inform the development of a national infectious disease plan, one that allows us to mount a faster public health response, to provide more targeted economic support in its wake, to guard against the selfish greed of profiteers who save lives. We owe our people equal opportunity to seek justice. Our newspaper had high, sorry, our newspaper headlines continue to show how poverty and gender can be barriers to legal recourse. These inter intersect in terrible ways to protect perpetrators of gender-based violence from the law. This is an affront to our own founding ideals of freedom and justice. So we intend to resource and operationalize the Victim Support Fund under the Domestic Violence Act, and we will implement the strategic plan of action to address gender-based violence. This is a commitment to provide mental health care for gender-based violence survivors, to create a national hotline to address gender-based violence, to harmonize the law to ensure survivors of gender violence, especially rape victims, are able to access free healthcare services and to enforce the Trafficking Against Persons Act. And to ensure that poverty is no longer a barrier to competent representation in our courts, we will increase resources for public defenders and expand the Ghana Legal Aid Commission to increase access to justice for the poor and the indigent. So on social justice for our people with disabilities. Central to our political identity as social democrats is a belief of equity and inclusion. We are invested in removing the barriers that exclude any Ghanaian from reaching their full potential, especially those potentials of gender and disability that worsen inequality in our society. Ghanaians living with disabilities continue to inspire with their tenacity, with their resilience, and we as a society must meet them with humility, with humanity, and be responsive to their needs. And this should not be done out of pity, but out of a sense of justice and a desire to do what is right. I was proud to hear the promise that His Excellency John Mahama made to the disabled community in WA last week. This government's decision to reduce the share, the current government's decision 
to reduce the share of the district common of the district assembly common fund allocated to disabled persons by a third is not acceptable. It is a failure of moral leadership on this matter, and it shows lack of interest in equity and inclusion. And that is why we pledge to review this decision. And because inclusion often means physical access for persons with disabilities, we intend to, and to ensure compliance of government buildings across the nation. Again, this is a moral priority. It is not a political one. Our commitment to social justice extends to gender. I'm living proof of it. But as I said a few weeks ago, the measure of a person's character is how you extend privilege to others. I believe that by, by holding the doors open and making many more women have opportunity to participate in this in, in nation building, we will receive other ideas, fresh ideas, fresh perspectives that will bring to our nation's development and that will also save our lives and guarantee the lifeblood of progress. Empowering more women will make our politics and government, governance more dynamic, more vibrant, more responsive, more inclusive. And in this hour of crisis, Ghana has never needed that freshness, energy, and optimism more than she does right now. Those of us as gatekeepers must recognize this. We must embrace it. We must facilitate others coming through the door. Therefore, the commitment to increase the participation of women in governance is not an idle one. We will focus that effort on the youth so that government of this country better reflects its gender and age demographics. The history of this nation has borne born out over and over again the power and potential of young people, including women, to move justice, inclusion, and accountability in governance forward. And while this sometimes means political opportunities, it has sense to so much more. That is why we intend to implement the Affirmative Action Bill. If it's not passed, we'll pass it, of course. This is a first step in the direction of justice for Ghanaian women and our centuries of contributions to this nation and the peoples that comprise it. But women face other challenges too. Poverty forces thousands of young girls in Ghana to miss as many as five days of school every month simply because they cannot afford sanitary pads. This is unacceptable and it is unfair. So we will provide free sanitary pads for girls to ensure that a perfectly, that a perfectly natural, perfectly normal part of their lives functioning does not become a barrier to education and a better life. So we will focus on girls under 20 who are in school. This is a problem we should have left behind us in the last century and which we, ad we tried to address in our, last government, in our last government. Our opposition ridiculed this idea, but then let us hope the lessons of governance have made them much, much wiser. And as these girls become women, those complexes, those challenges become even more complicated, if not complex. For many young women in the workplace, Having a child is a big decision because of what it can mean for their career trajectory. Balancing the demands of office life, the needs of a newborn, and the societal expectations around child care present real challenges for working mothers. And when the kids are still babies, care and feeding means time off from work. Three months certainly is not enough for that. 
women often have to rely on their annual leave to supplement their maternity leave. And any mother will tell you that that means a whole year work with no time off. So, we will extend maternity leave from three to four months. And we will also offer seven days of paternity leave. Childcare itself is another, becomes another obstacle. When young families cannot afford childcare or have no one to lean, to lean on for support, it is the women whose careers and aspirations suffer the consequences. So as part of our plan to invest in early childhood development, we will work to ensure that creches, daycare centers, and nurseries for children are established in formal workplaces. For example, the ministries complex and let's say our markets too. But women also face unique threats. Sexual violence is one of them. Our current system of serving justice to victims and perpetrators is beneath the dignity of this nation and of the women who love and who nurture this nation. This needs to change. And that means comprehensive systemic reform. The time is now. So in addition to the criminal justice reforms that I've already outlined, we intend to abolish all charges for medical examinations for victims of sexual assault. It is an abominable disincentive for many women, and it is also only more so the poorer they are. This is morally unacceptable, and there's no justice in that. I want you men of this country to know that these commitments we make for you today are also personal for me. I intend to see them done. We have waited for too long, and the time for action is now. We in the NDC believe that another measure of our national character is in how the most vulnerable are treated. We have a long way to go on this path, but we have a plan for that too. We intend to establish an orphan and vulnerable child support scheme as a special vehicle to protect the rights and interests of vulnerable children. And we will promote the construction and upgrading of shelters for vulnerable persons, such as survivors of gender-based violence and trafficked persons. And to my friends Akayaye in our urban centers and those who are who form part of the extremely vulnerable group because of their gender or because of their poverty status. We will introduce skills training, social assistance programs in order to ensure that we stall the flow of such women into environments that are not protective at all. We will establish a center of excellence for training social workers to take care of vulnerable, including the elderly, and recognizing the needs and challenges of aging in our time, we will also amend the National Health Insurance Act to reduce the age of eligibility for premium payments under the National Health Insurance Scheme from 70 to 65. and recognizing the challenges that young persons living with disabilities face in accessing education, we are committed to providing them with free tertiary education. Our senior citizens deserve our respect and compassion, which comes and lynching of the aged do not belong to this era. The NDC is determined to stimulate public education and to change the fortunes of the elderly and to bring the perpetrators to book. The next NDC government will support 
the Department of Social Welfare to create day centers and homes for the aged, reactivate the urban elderly welfare card to enable Ghanaians above 60 years have priority access to social services, and we shall amend Section 29H of the National Health Insurance Act 2012 to enable all persons age 60 and above to be exempt from premium payment under the NHIS. The NDC recognizes historical inequalities between our Zongos deprived urban settlements and other communities. The next NDC government will provide regular funding through the District Assembly Common Fund for the development of the Zongos and deprived urban settlements to, to bridge the inequality gap, strengthen and resource the Islamic education units under the Ghana Education Service to enable the units monitor and recruit more Islamic and Arabic tutors, establish, establish two senior Islamic senior high schools in the southern and northern sectors for the Zongo communities and others, support the only Islamic College of Education, which we established during my tenure as Minister for Education by revisiting abandoned infrastructure and providing logistics to enable them recruit and train more teachers. We shall award scholarships to brilliant but needy students in these deprived communities. And especially, we will focus on girls in medical, nursing, educational training. We also intend to provide mentorship programs and opportunities for the youth in these areas. Support Arabic teachers in the Makaranta with monthly allowances. Enroll youth in Zongo and deprived settlements into the National Apprenticeship Program, as well as ensure that they benefit under the free technical and vocational education and training. That is the free TVET. We will endeavor to ensure that a representative from the Muslim Ummah is placed on the board of the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs. It's all about fairness. It's all about equity. We shall liaise with some banks and other financial institutions to launch the Zongo Housing Scheme to provide support for affordable housing in the Zongos and deprived urban settlements. The NDC is committed to prioritizing youth development through various youth empowerment and entrepreneurship policies and programs. We take cognizance of the growing disappointment and frustration among the youth as a result of high unemployment, which has been worsened by ill-conceived and poorly managed policies of the current administration. The next NDC government will harness the potential of our youth by implementing comprehensive, multifaceted, and innovative programs. We will also provide a more effective institutional framework for empowering our youth for national development. We will have a stand-alone ministry for youth, for youth development. And we'll advance our youth empowerment agenda. It will mainstream and prioritize youth issues coordinate the implementation of comprehensive youth development policies and related agencies, address the multifaceted issues confronting the various categories of youth in the country, coordinate entrepreneurship and skills training opportunities for all young persons, especially vulnerable youth groups, facilitate youth participation in decision-making at all levels for national development, build the capacities of our youth and create more employment, decentralize the labor office. His Excellency has already talked about it. The One Million Coders program is an initiative that will be implemented through a public-private partnership to provide free training 
to about 1 million youth with knowledge and skills for coding and programming, web developing, apps developing, expand opportunities in the knowledge and ICT-based economy. In closing, I'll make a few comments. Our manifesto, the People's Manifesto, has been well thought out. What makes it credible is that we have a dependable track record to back it up. The, peop the people believe in us because if it is about infrastructure, if it is about healthcare facilities, if it is about schools, if it's about roads, our track record towers above that of anyone. We have no reason to falsely lay claim to projects initiated by another government and even forge non-existent ones. Ghanaians believe us because there's evidence of what we can do and what we do with the revenues and loans we contract. The people believe us when we say we are Democrats because we are. We do not hunt and taunt those who disagree with us because we cherish freedom of speech. We believe the true test of leadership is to eschew arrogance. We do not set out to collapse businesses of those who do not belong to our party. We are a party of fair-minded people. We believe in equal opportunity and so we give every Ghanaian his or her due. We believe in adding to what we, we inherit. We do not destroy what others have told to create so that anyone will reap where they have not sown. What we have experienced in this country over the, over the last couple of years does not augur well for our country. Nepotism, cronyism, masquerading as business it's not good for us. Ghana should not endure more of that. Over the next three months, we will carry our message of progress and inclusion to every corner of our country. We look forward eagerly to contrast our vision for the next four years and beyond with any other contestants. This election is going to be about trust. It's going to be about judgment and vision. John Mahama showed all three in the first major decision he made as part of his governance plan for 2021 and beyond. That is His Excellency Mahama's vision for progress. And that is the vision I joined this ticket to help him to realize. I trust and I believe in this vision. I have seen close up his thoughtfulness and the great value he places on introspection. We share a belief that growth, personal or otherwise, always means change. The President Mahama I know always seeks wisdom in the words even of his critics. He is interested in the views of everyone, especially the so-called common person. Always his abiding questions include, how does this suggestion help the poor, the vulnerable? How does this intervention improve lives? Such concerns resonate well with mine and no doubt with those of many others who also believe that voting is an expression of hope, of trust, of judgment, of faith. The power to extend must, must be returned in ways that uphold the dignity of human life. That improves the trust of the citizenry in institutions that are expected to be fair, transparent, and protective. That is the character of the man, and that is why I am proud to be his partner in this vision for jobs, prosperity, and more. We, that is the NDC, we are a party for everyone the farmer, the fisherman, the educated, the non-educated, the teacher, the nurse, the vulnerable, the market trader, the hawker, everyone is welcome. We welcome everyone regardless of status 
or background. And we invite you all to join us in building a prosperous country in peace and togetherness for the benefit of all Ghanaians. What we will not accept is a premise that Ghana belongs to some elite few who arrogate to themselves the right to determine among themselves how to share our precious resources. Let there be no doubt that this country, our beloved country called Ghana, belongs to all of us, including generations unborn. Let our actions bear witness to that. And those who receive the high privilege of being elected to serve must jealously hold and guard the sacred trust of the people. This we pledge to do. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please come join us. Let's spread the good news of the People's Manifesto. And on December 7th, join us again in reminding those who may have chosen to forget the truth that the people are the real owners of this country. Thank you very much for your attention. This is still the point of view. We're coming to you live from the UPSA, where the running mate for the NDC, Professor Jane Anopokwajiman, finished her presentation. Uh, we are expecting another presentation, but I'm here with Umaru Sanda Amadou, who's been covering with me. So, Umaru, it, it looks like a novel. We started at 6 o'clock, and what's the logic behind the three-piece presentation? Well, so if you, if you look at the MPP one that we went to do in Cape Coast, they brought ministers and other members of the party to speak on thematic areas. What the NDC has decided to do is to use videos to show a lot of the issues, what it has planned to do, and have fewer speakers, so five speakers, but they have broken them down. And John Mahama, who introduced his run, but she has to introduce again, uh, is the one who introduced her, and I think he's inviting her back on the stage. So uh, maybe I'll try and break it down for you when we go back. So he did his speech, introduced his running mate to speak, and he's back on stage. Again, yeah. Okay, so we would hear him out yeah. and see what we do. He's probably going to fill in the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going back to the hall for the final presentation from the candidate himself, and then we'll be right back. There's establishment of a microfinance fund for Zungos and deprived urban communities, and it's called the Soyeya Fund. Ezu. Ezu. The fund, the fund will be accessible to all people who live within Zungus and deprived urban communities, and it will not discriminate. Um, in, in, in addition, I'll just mention a few uh, uh, things to do with sports, or as the sports fraternity will not forgive us. We'll establish a sports development fund, and um, we'll develop a comprehensive national sports policy to outline the vision and strategies for sports development in Ghana. We'll revive and invest in inter-school and colleges games in order to develop talent. For companies that invest in sports, we will facilitate tax exemption and tax relief regimes to motivate private sponsorship and promotion of sports. We'll promote and provide funding for the lesser known indigenous sports will ensure the successful hosting and organization of the 13th Africa Games to be hosted in Ghana in September 2023. We will continue and complete the new Edubiasi Sports Stadium and will establish sports stadia and other recreational facilities in communities and in all the districts. Now this is an interesting one. We'll use the Sports Development Fund to assist the sports associations to provide and improve remuneration and welfare of local sportsmen and women. This fund will also be utilized to assist teams for teams that qualify.
for com uh, continental competitions. This fund will assist them to be able to uh, go and participate in the competition. And the final part, um, we'll vigorously reform and expand access to professional legal education. Um, Honorable Minority Leader spoke about that. We'll provide opportunities for all qualified LLB holders by granting accreditation to certified law faculties to undertake the professional law qualification course. He spoke about that. We'll establish high courts in the six newly created regions, and we will decentralize the services of the appeals courts by providing facilities for the appeals courts in the western, northern, and Volta regions. We will pay assemblymen, uh, members. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we will pay assembly members and give them responsibility for the collection of births and deaths statistics in their electoral areas. We will ensure the depoliticization deep deep of the civil and local government services. We will upgrade the whole Kaswa, Ashaman, Techiman, Koforidia, Sunyani, Bogatanga, Hohoi, and Wa municipal assemblies into metropolitan assemblies. We'll, we'll, we'll establish accounts for disability, the disability fund in every district. And so the uh, percentage meant for this, uh, uh, this, uh, the disability fund will be paid into a special account. 50% will go to paying a stipend to recognize persons living with disability in the district. And the other 50% will be used to invest in projects that will benefit the persons living with disability. Uh, security will implement the report of the inquiry into the Iwaso West Wagon vigilante incident. We will, we will empower the 48 engineers regiment to construct living accommodation for security personnel to establish new military presence and installations across the country, especially in the new regions that do not have a military installation. We'll establish a new military training and recruiting academy for the northern sector of the country. We'll establish a police station, a district police station in every district where there is none. We'll review and enforce medical packages for both serving and retired personnel and their families. We'll review the compensation package for personnel who lose their lives or get injured in the line of duty. We'll clear, we'll clear the backlog of promotions and ensure timely promotion based on merit and transparency. We'll depoliticize the Ghana Armed Forces and restore discipline and loyalty to the state. We'll encourage and expand opportunities for non-commissioned officers, that's other ranks, to access officer cadet training where appropriate. We'll construct housing units and residential accommodation for the Ghana Armed Forces, refurbish dilapidated and abandoned housing units across the country, systematically review upward salaries and allowances of troops and their civilian employees, upgrade retirement benefits for personnel, establish Armed Forces home ownership schemes for Armed Forces personnel, complete and equip the Kumasi Military Hospital at Afari. Um, other things, I'll jump some of them. Establish Armed Forces agribusiness and processing units, revamp, revamp the defense industry to produce clothing, boots, and accessories for the Ghana Armed Forces and other security services. We'll expand and equip the Field Engineers Corps to undertake national emergency projects, including road construction, and be licensed to undertake commercial ventures of the Ghana government. We'll roll out transparent and accessible police education and scholarship scheme. 
will increase officer and residential accommodation for personnel of the Ghana Police Service. We will complete the police hospital project. We will construct a second police hospital in the northern part of the country. Complete the construct construction of the Dofsu headquarters, and I'm sure this is one that the police officers are waiting for. Use a yearly internal recruitment approach to grant amnesty to police personnel who privately acquired additional qualifications from recognized tertiary institutions, such that some of them can become officers each year through an accelerated promotion regime. We will maintain, we'll maintain the Cap 30 pension scheme for police service personnel. We will implement the Ghana Prisons Decongestion Project. We will modernize the prison system and make it more humane. We will provide facilities to separate remand prisoners from convicted prisoners. We will set up a special remand sentence review committee to review cases of persons uh, uh, accused of you know, um, light offenses. Encourage community service and other, other non-custodial sentences for minor offenders. Create well-equipped technical and vocational departments in all prisons. Ensure proper health care facilities in the prisons. Ensure safety and security of Ghanaians by reconstituting the joint military police um, anti-armed robbery patrols. We'll restore the visibility police. And so at every intersection, we'll have police in order to keep crime under control. We'll conduct investigations into the assassination of Ahmed Swali and other unsolved cases. <laughs> including the murder of the late Honorable J.B. Dankwa. We'll change the current climate of fear intimidation and harassment of the media. We will continue the process towards passing the broadcasting bill. We will develop a media development fund to support professional training of journalists and media organizations as part of COVID-19 relief package. The NDC will address the canker of nepotism and growing corruption. We will restore the integrity and strengthen independent anti-corruption institutions and they will be at the forefront of our fight against corruption. We'll strengthen the anti-corruption institutions like Traj, Yoko, the Financial Intelligence Center, the Office of Special Prosecutor, and empower them to investigate all cases of corruption swept under the carpet by this administration. They will also be empowered, they will also be empowered and free to investigate any incidents of corruption under the next NDC administration. We will introduce legislation to regulate agency representation and the conduct of business practices of multinational companies. This means that if a multinational company wants to do business in Ghana, it's not a crime to have an agent, but they will be compelled to disclose who their agencies, agents are for transparency, for purposes of transparency. Update the guidelines for political office holders developed and launched uh, during my administration. The presidency shall not act as a clearing house for corrupt appointees. <laughs> Lunch operation state workers. Amend the law to enable publication and audit of assets declaration forms by political and public office holders. Codify the conflict of interest situations. Make single source procurements or sole sourcing an exception and not the rule. Create a fairer emolument system and remove the distortions between Article 71 office holders and other public sector employees. Reduce drastically the current size of ministers and their deputies. Reduce the number of political appointees at the presidency and other institutions. Reduce the number of ministries in order to save cost. Continue and complete the constitutional review process. Depoliticize the civil and public services. Roll out an aggressive social housing plan to deliver a minimum of 20,000 low-income low houses in all districts of Ghana. 
MMDAs will work with traditional authorities to acquire lands for the project. All materials for the housing will be sourced locally and will implement a national mortgage assistance scheme for security services and other public sector employees. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank the National Manifesto Committee for the diligent work that they did. It has taken them many sleepless nights to be able to complete this work. I believe that this is a manifesto that holds the key to the destiny of Ghana. It is possible, it is implementable, and I know that with the support of my running mate, Professor Nana Jenopokwa Jumai, the executives of our party and our government to be come January 7, 2021, we will be able to implement this project, this manifesto. I know it's not going to be easy because we are looking at the numbers. We know we're going to inherit a very tattered economy. For those who pride themselves on economic management, I mean, they should really feel ashamed to hand over an economy like this to another administration. Highly distressed in terms of debts, budget and fiscal overruns, uncontrolled borrowing from the central bank now, and we understand the difficulties we're going to face. One of the first things we'll do is to achieve consensus on economic management. And so we will hold a second Sinchi conference, for those of you who remember Sinchi 1, which was boycotted by the NPP. I hope this time, even if they're in opposition, they will join us for Sinchi 2, so that we achieve consensus on economic management and fiscal consolidation going forward. I want to thank our National Executive Committee for the emergency meeting this morning to approve the manifesto. At this juncture, I'll invite my running mate, Nana, to come up and join me as we launch the manifesto. It is our honor and privilege to declare the 2020 Manifesto of the National Democratic Cong Cong uh, Congress with the theme Jobs and Prosperity for All, the People's Manifesto, duly launched. We, we also, we're also conscious of our persons living with disability. And so we did not only complete and launch the main manifesto, we also completed and we are launching today the Braille version of the NDC manifesto. Thank you very much and God richly bless all of us. coverage of the NDC manifesto launch we are on the point of view and we just uh, saw president or candidate Mahama and his running mate deliver their respective presentations and launch the manifesto it started at 6 it's 4 minutes to 10 p.m. Marusan has been 4 hours it's been, it's been it's been very hectic i mean um, Bernard, you know and, and, and it may not be fair to be doing a comparing and contrasting tonight, but of course, these two parties ought to be compared and contrasted. Now, Dr. Mahmoud Obanya from 2012 has been like the guy who leads presentation of the MPP. Even when they were going for the uh, election petition, he did that big uh, PowerPoint and so on. So maybe if you wanted to compare, Nana Jenopoku Ajiman should be the one who is leading this presentation. But we know that she's not an economy person. 
So the areas where she's strong, she was made to do that. John Mahama, who has once chaired the economic management team, was now the one who did the economy, the infrastructure, and then ushers her in because she's still been outdoored and been introduced to the party. Then she comes in, does the issues that she's stronger in, education, she talks about children, development, and so on. And then John Mahama comes up and continues to do the rapid so it's a deliberate. So it, I think it's a deliberate. Division of labor. Division. For the candidate to speak on the harder issues and then she went to the human development kind of issues. I, th I think the, the, the promises they have or the plans they have are so huge that even the two of them split between them will not give us everything. So Haruna Idris, who had even had to come in earlier and give us one or two of the pointers, for instance, the issue about legal education, which has been very controversial the past three months. Haruna Idris, who is the one who comes as a lawyer, as a leader of the minority in parliament, comes to talk about that particular issue. So you notice that they have decided to evenly share them. But the issues that they have raised are so many, and it will be worth so, to mention a few of them. Uh, which caught your attention, or which of the promises or plans would you say caught your attention because it would be quite a long presentation well as a journalist uh, a lot of them caught my attention i noticed a lot of um, attempts and i'm using this advisedly to counter a lot of the things the mpp raised for instance the issue of the rent uh, mpp said they were going to provide you with some financial support to pay your rent at a fee or at a loan uh, this one says they're going to provide you with um, an authority but for me what excites me the most is that we are going to have a solution to this issue of Okada. That's if NDC wins. Bernard, Okada may be a nuisance here in, in, the, in the capital city. But if you go to some areas, without an Okada, people cannot move. Vehicles literally don't move. I have traveled to the northern part of the country, the Gushao, and when I missed the market bus, I was told I have to wait for three or four days for the next market day before I can move from Gushao to, um, um, to, to the Minister for Local Government's constituency, where Nalerigu, yes. Nalerigu Gambaga. So I've had to hire the services of the local butcher to sit on his bike to take me on that ride. So motorbikes are essential in a lot of these areas. Maybe the issues of Accra should be considered. But I have noticed that in Tamale, Okada riders obey traffic regulations. I don't know why they don't do that in Accra. So it's important. If they say they are going to regularize and legalize, then it's very critical that we see that. So, so that promise appeared to have a lot of tears. It was a popular promise. What else caught your attention? During so let me rather list a few of the things that they talk about. So on Mahama's thing, the expanding of the legal education, they've talked about private schools at the senior high school level Level, are going to be free now free senior high school is a big deal it's a it's a it's a policy that you should give the thumbs up to the Akufado administration it's something they have done within 10 months despite of giving it has given for the opportunity to school I'm a product of scholarships and and so while we're on it Sami Jemfi just brought us a newly minted copy of the of the document. Yeah. So so I'm saying, I'm a I'm a product of scholarships, Bernard, from a district. T free SHS. I know that this is something that should be celebrated, but there was a problem with free SHS. We know the issue of double track, and now the issue of private schools. A lot of private schools have had to fold. So if private schools folding, how do you? Okay. This is where the private again. All right. So this is still the point of view. We're trying to do a quick uh, review of what we've just seen. And this is the document. It's about 120 pages. We'll be speaking to some of the officials of the NDC on their views on this. They have sent out a list of um, spokespersons for all the thematic areas. And so I'm going to be uh, getting a few of them to join us to share their quick impressions. Uh, maybe to talk about the style first, because this was quite interesting. You had President Mahama speak, uh, running mate Professor Jay Nana coming in, and President Mahama coming back. So his special uh, spokesperson, uh, Joyce Baba Mukhtar, is just joining us. Joyce, congratulations on a, on a good program. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we started at 6, we ended at 10. Um, was that the initial plan? Was it was it to be a four-hour program? 
<laughs> I may have to be translator because it's very noisy. She didn't hear your question. Okay, you can't hear me at all. I, I, okay, what are your impressions? What are your general impressions? Oh, thank you very, very much, Bernard. I think my impressions are of a fantastic job, a well executed, pro a consultative process that has actually landed us all in this manifesto that has been touted as the People's Manifesto. One that spans all the touches the lives of all citizens. I believe like all our other manifestos, the 2020 manifesto is responsive to the needs of the Why we celebrate his day, of course, by His Excellency John Dramani, nominee Professor Nana Jeno Popuajima. I believe that the National Democratic Congress, the Manifesto Committee, the National Executive Committee, and indeed all members of our party are enormously proud and elated about great achievements. What is the biggest one or two things here? There's a lot For here. What's me, your biggest thing here? Personally, the biggest thing is the fact that there will be that ten billion dollar big push. The big push. That will create and stimulate our economy after COVID, it will create jobs in the road sector, in the hospitality sector, it will create jobs in railways, it will build a new economy for the good people of Ghana. Indeed, Ghana faces a youth bulge, which also has joblessness as part of the challenges that we face as a people. I believe that this 10 billion big push would create the necessary sustainable jobs in the words of Professor Nana Jin, for the good people of Ghana. I also think the second thing for me would be certainly the legalization of Okada. Wow. This is one of those things that has become an avenue, a conduit for jobs for the people of Ghana. If you've never had a job before, if you haven't suffered from unemployment, if you haven't suffered from need, you might not understand. I believe that this is something that has come up as a result of the lack of opportunity for many people. Wow. And each day we buy motorcycles, we donate motorcycles, we give them out to dispatch riders. Imagine COVID without these dispatch riders. Actually try, there is a dispatch rider taking from one place to the other. They actually operate vagaries of the police and many other activities because one, it is not legal, so they are actually being manipulated. If we legalize it, we can name the persons who own the motorcycles. Apart from that, remember there are jolly riders, just like people who use them. People who ride them. If we legalize and register it, we'll not be happy. Join, right? The bus to our sites, to our but certainly motorcycles have gotten brides and bridegrooms to the church wow. on time. So it's an economic message, the big push Absolutely. and the Okada message. Absolutely. So you are running this as an economic or economic issue election? Purely That's the primary issue. The Absolutely, economy. largely. Wow. Because that will determine our next step. And indeed, a good economy, a well-stimulated economy, a well-oiled economy, mean it would translate into more jobs for the young people just of finally Ghana. i didn't hear president mahama mention anapu fado's name at all in the first round of his speeches was that deliberate or an oversight well considering that their whole launch was about john mahama we decided that we will swerve them on this occasion you swerve them absolutely <laughs> but this was um, in when MPP was campaigning, every day when Nanado speaks, there's almost a promise coming up. And in their manifesto, even after the manifesto, they kept giving promises. Tonight, watching you, it's almost like you are trying to outrun the MPP in terms of promises. We are matching them boots for boots. You are even promises. over matching them. You are promising so much that your candidate did, I mean, your minority leader promised, your running mate, your candidate came to promise. Your running mate came back to promise. Your candidate finally comes to round up. Too many promises. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't get the, get the order of proceedings right. We had a process where the former president, the flag bearer, John Dramani Mahama, was going to handle the economy. 
He was going to handle energy. He was going to handle power. He was going to handle job creation. And of course, he was going to handle some aspects of our social contract. The running mate, Professor Jan Najee Nokokwa was supposed to handle all matters to do with human development. Certainly in the aftermath, because of the time of also, President Mahama decided to allow her to come and make her presentation, and then he'd come and conclude it. Indeed, the minority leader spoke on governance. And if you notice, because of time, he didn't actually go through it extensively. So President Mahama only came in to tie up the knots on what the minority leader had spoken to, and of course, what his running mate had spoken to as well. Indeed, I believe that if you compare this manifesto to our 2012 manifesto and to our 2016 manifesto, you realize it is a message that resonates with all of our manifestos. The emphasis on infrastructure, the emphasis on reforms, the emphasis on anti-corruption proceedings, and above all, the emphasis on the good people of Ghana. I believe it is the gift that John Dramani Mahama would leave for the good people of this country. Wow. And I believe I listened to a few members of the civil society organization and they are quite amazed and believe that we must indeed have consulted extensively to arrive at this very simple, well-written, well-crafted, well-thought-through, above all, a very well-researched document. Of course, in the coming days, we'll have opportunity to dissect on many aspects of this 2020 manifesto. Thank you very Beyond much. Beyond that, I wish President Mahama and, of course, Professor Nana Jane the very best. And I look forward to them forming the next government come January 7th, 2021. Thank you very much. That was Joyce Bauer Mukhtari, who's a spokesperson for uh, President Mahama. We will come back with more people. Thank you, uh, Joyce. We are still bringing you a live coverage of the 2020 manifesto of the NDC. Uh, Elvis Afriye Ankara is the director of elections of the party. So this is one of the few programs where he hasn't said much. Uh, uh, Sander, I'm going to get Sylvester Mesa to also join us as well. So uh, we are joined also by the one of the spokespersons on health for the NDC. So uh, Elvis, I was, I was going to say that for many NDC programs, you're either the MC or you are playing a key role. But this is one of the few programs you haven't said anything. Is it deliberate? What's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm more dangerous when I don't speak. <laughs> well, we are, we are a bit far. You can take off your mask now. So, okay. yes, so we can just have a chat. This is one of the few programs I've attended that you haven't said anything as an NDC program. What's going on? I, I'm more dangerous when I don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> you are more dangerous when you don't speak. <laughs> but, but, but I was part of the validation team. Together with him, we spent two days in Pedia So we've been part of it. But as you know, these days I'm focusing more on technical and technical electoral issues, issues and numbers. strategic issues. Looking at our elections, how important is a manifesto? Because some people think that right now, Charlie, it's not about manifesto anymore because we had a, 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 a former president we know and we have a president who's also in office. So it's four years versus three and a half years. So it's records comparison and not manifestos. No, no, no. Manifestos are important and critical because I believe that one of the things that the MPP was their salacious manifesto and all the promises that it came. And it was so salacious. I mean, they'll do this, they'll do that, they'll transform the country, they won't borrow money, they, they, they've been at the Bank of Ghana, they know where the money is, and we have too many things. They have been in government before. People believe them, they gave them the opportunity. Lo and behold, they've come into power, and everybody can see their performance. So gives us an opportunity with the backdrop of what we did when we were in office with smaller resources we had just one oil well when we were in power we borrowed less amount of money and then we've been able to do much more than this mpp that have three oil wells that have borrowed more than any other government in the history of ghana not even this report the history of ghana they've borrowed more than anybody else more than double what we borrowed what they've done is there for everybody to see. They haven't done anything. So we are now presenting our program based on our past performance, based on the track record and personality of the former president. Somebody that you know you can trust, somebody who gave certain promises and was able to deliver effectively, and somebody who says opportunity of sitting back 
and reflecting on all the things that I did, the ones that were good, the mistakes I made, and I'm coming back better and stronger so it's a to move back records to take us it's a so it is an economics election because there are some elections that are based on corruption more this looks like an economics you are taking the economy and challenging mpp to compare their record with yours is that the message for this it, election it's me of living of people it goes beyond the economy it goes to the election is about the soul of this country it's about the survival of our democracy it's about the stability of this country it's about the security of this country because you have a president who is supposed to be an arbiter of the rule of law and that is what we've seen the most atrocious form of governance in the history of this country terrible things have happened sometimes you sit back and you ask yourself are these things really happening in ghana i am also west Walker. we all saw it in broadly your colleagues murdered, assassination. Some of your colleagues can't talk. I used to criticize you a lot. But then I sat down and I reflected and I realized that what they say in a camp palace, they are all afraid, most of you. There's only a few of you who have the guts to speak. Really? Oh yeah, only a few of you, people like you. But most of your colleagues are afraid to speak because if you are not careful, what will happen to you? And the people who threaten them are in impunity. This cannot be allowed to happen. People are killed, assassinated, murdered. People sit on air and threaten people with death, and they get away with it. So it's an economic election. Let me ask uh, Sylvester Mensa, who is a member of the health group, because he's been designated as one of the health guys. What's your big message here? Because communicators will ask, so at the end of the day, what is Mahama say is coming to do? So for you, what's the biggest yeah. thing in this thing? Well, thank you very much that by uh, thanking you for this opportunity and to thank our viewers and listeners. Uh, this is one of the best manifestos I have come across. And in particular, if we look at the health sector, the biggest takeaway is the policy on uh, free primary health care. But beyond that, there are a number of policies in the health sector that are worth mentioning. One. The manifesto is talking about instituting framework contracting for pharmaceutical supply and introducing the private sector into the supply chain of pharmaceuticals in this country. We all know that drugs in Ghana are quite expensive and within the context of the health scheme, medicines account for well over 50 percent. In countries like South Korea and other places, medicines account for, or pharmaceuticals, account for just about 27% of their total cost of care delivery. It means that we have a long way to go as a country in ensuring efficiency in our pharmaceutical supply chain. And so framework contracting comes in addressing that difficulty. Number two, the, the, the manifesto and at least we all know that the world over our purchases of uh, uh, hospital yeah. are outmoded. Countries now engage in a much a less ex ex expensive yeah. access to equipment and uh, that reduces further the cost but of there's a question for you on NHIS. Usually in election years Oppositions criticize the NHIS. I remember MPP said NHIS. I'm not sure if I heard too much on the NHIS. Is it that it's not bad anymore? Because you used to run that institution. It didn't feature this much in this manifesto. What, what is the issue? Is it that the NHIS is now working well? Well, the NHIS feature, features greatly in this manifesto. Okay. If you look at the But it wasn't sector, highlighted there, so maybe it's in the yeah, document, but it, it wasn't is, highlighted it there. It is there. Now, okay. let me also say that it was out of ignorance that most people were criticizing the health insurance scheme. I guess with the experience they have had now, the reality would have gone on them. Uh, it takes the president the, 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 and the finance ministry as it were, to pay claims and not health insurance. The health insurance scheme is not responsible for generating the funds for the payment of claims. It is only when government releases the funds and when government makes adequate provision 
that health insurance is able to clear its arrears and be up to date with its providers and to reduce the cock ups and hiccups that usually occur. As we speak today, we know that the health insurance is operating an arrears in excess of nine months. Providers are in distress. Government has lost control. Government simply can do nothing about it now because they have mismanaged our economy. This manifesto makes provision for additional funding for the health insurance scheme and goes on further to provide further reliefs that will enable this country achieve universal health coverage consistent with the sustainable development goals of the World Health Organization. The free primary health care provides an opportunity for all Ghanaians in a one sweep, one go, achieve I mean, universal health coverage okay. by making it free for all Ghanaians. Let me come the, to the mechanics of that is yet to be worked out. Okay. But this is a great. Besides, there's this policy of uh, instituting a patient's uh, protection council that would allow for patients to, as it were, complain in times of uh, negligence, as, as it is now. Issues of uh, medical negligence uh, uh, go unpunished. And, uh, it is difficult to have the, the very medical institutions investigate cases. We are now moving a step further to a greater level of efficiency in our healthcare delivery and to hold our delivery officials accountable and responsible for their actions. We have a lot of respectable, competent and experienced health professionals, but the work of just a few who are negligent is telling on the majority of them and there's a need to call out some of those people, to make examples of some of those people in order to inject some level of efficiency and seriousness and accountability in the health system. Just a final one to Elvis and then you. I think one promise that got a lot of cheers was the Okada promise. You used to run local government ministry. You know this is a very complicated problem. Isn't it a risk you are taking? Because whereas in many communities people use Okada, in the urban areas people see it as a health and safety issue. Isn't this a risky promise to make that you're going to regulate and legalize Okada? So, um, first of all, you formulate policy that would benefit and impact other people. Mm. Is there a real demand for Okada services? That's one on the demand side. It's there. Two, it is meeting a need. Three, it is creating jobs and opportunities for young people. There are people who lost jobs in the banks, those who were sacked from the banks, where the banks collapsed, they are now doing a quarter. So it's a reality that has come to stay. So what a responsible government would do is to look at the prevailing circumstances and fashion out and formulate policy that will regulate their activities. So what we're going to do is to put in place a system, legislation, rules, regulations, ensure that they have helmets, Passengers have helmet, they go through training, insurance, and all that, so that we can streamline the activities. I think that is a better approach rather than to live in denial that it doesn't exist, and yet they keep doing it and they ask themselves to reach. So it's a very solving an emerging problem. Besides, besides, on the same issue of Okada, I've been to South Korea. I've seen Okada in South Korea. South Korea. You've seen Okada in South Korea. South Korea. I've seen Okada in Japan. I've seen Okada in China. And so what we need to do in Ghana is exactly what we are doing, to legalize it and importantly regulate it. If you don't regulate it, you're going to have Okada drivers crossing the red light. You're going to have Okada drivers without safety equipment, without their helmets. You're going to have Okada drivers carrying four or five passengers. You're going to have all kinds of difficulties would generate the hazards that we are experiencing. If we're able to regulate having Okada driver taking over the uh, wrong side of the road and all that, we all minimized. So I think that, uh, uh, look, whether you legalize it or not, they are there. All political parties have been buying motorbikes for their. So is Okada your free SHS? 
is, is, the, is the Okada your free SHS? We are not talking about free Because we all admit that free SHS was, Elvis admits it, it was one of the major things that they did for Nanado. Because it resonated from 2012, he repeated it. So could Okada... Could Okada be your free agent? Why did I say that? I said no, that you said it was, it was not specific. No, but I said it so was one of his big... It was, you, you admitted that the manifesto contributed to his victory. Many, many... Particularly the free I didn't say that. You are saying I'm that. putting it to you no, now. You are saying it. It's Okada one your free agent. One country, which is not existing. One village, one dam, which doesn't exist. They will not borrow money. No, I mean, let me respond it's to Okada that. Your free let, let me respond to that. The issue of uh, free SHS is an issue that began with the NDC. Really? The NDC as a political party began the implementation of free SHS on an incremental basis. Okay. The MPP came up and quickly decided to rush the program without looking at the infrastructural requirements and a few others. Be that as it may, it's been implemented, it has a lot of challenges. The NDC is coming to make the free SHS better and to make it freer and to get parents and uh, students enjoy real free really? and so the real free shs is going to come in january 2000 uh, 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 2021 so free, 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 yes. yeah so the free shs one with facility, adequate facility let's talk briefly about campaigning before you go both of you are electoral people, elections people. COVID is here. Campaign is different. In the past, you used to do mass rallies. It's not going to be possible. How is that going to affect an opposition party in your strategizing? In a way, it, we are able to engage more. Okay. The community engagement meetings, using the media, this event being country so it's it's something that we've taken advantage of and we're doing it i think that it will be all right so the lack of crowds wouldn't affect you which regions are you taking back because a lot of the swing regions central greater accra ba and western were not very kind to you in 2008 those regions went for you massively and in 2012 you maintain some of them i'm sure you're thinking central particularly was difficult you got only four of the seats which of them are you looking at strategies are you implementing? I don't, I don't <laughs> like discussing strategy <laughs> in public. At the end of the day, you will see the manifestation of all that we've put in place. So, exactly. The biggest shop you get will be in Ashanti region. Just wait. The biggest shop will be in Ashanti region. Yes, mark my words. Call me 7 December. I'll be on your panel to do the analysis. Usually, you need at least. 30 percent ashanti to I'm win saying that it will be and the last time you had below 25 you will see it will we are, we are getting shot. beyond 30 percent ashanti yes Mark really my words. yeah oh good luck to you thank you thank you for talking to us thank we're, you we're, thank you Bernard. We're thank still you very here much on the special Seven coverage december night will be here to analyze the victory umaru who do you have for me uh, <clears throat> we're still on the the point of view here at the upsa I'm going to speak to a few more people. Sedina Tamaklo, former Maslog boss and uh, manifesto spokesperson for the youth is See, quick, quick comments as we try and wrap up. Sedina, welcome. Benedicta, welcome. So it's been a long program and um, your party has launched its manifesto. I always ask the people, what's the biggest thing in there for you? Somebody says the big push. Somebody says Okada. Somebody says they will make free SHS freer. Which was the biggest thing for you listening to the presentation? Um, I established the tricycle project when I was a man. Okay. And it was a successful project. Apart from that, it impacted a lot of lives because it was something that the youth needed. Initially, Maslok was dealing mainly with women, about, we're doing about 75, 80% women, and about 10% male and maybe 10 percent youth but i needed to increase the youth component and so we introduced this tricycle project at the time it was very difficult because it was still illegal but now you see young people using it as a means of employment um, carting water goods all kinds of uh, uh, things vegetable produce 
whatever and it's, it has impacted their lives so I'm, I'm really happy that we've, we've uh, gone with this Okada thing and it's so going it's to... Tricycles. It's not just... yes, it's, it's going so to Okada and tricycles. Um, anything that was illegal to use for commercial purposes, and so for that reason, even now, is not officially legal. It has become a means of the biggest announcements. The big push 10 billion. But has he told us where he's going to get it from? Where, where is he getting the 10 billion from? Oh, well, I mean, you, you see what's going on now. All kinds of things are happening. Money is being I mean, this government, the current government, has put 120 billion. We can see what we already have had. So I'm going to borrow 10 billion. So 10 billion is just a drop in the bucket. And, and we will do it. We've done it before. Look at the infrastructure we put across the country. 125 billion. At various conditions. Interesting. So the big push and and Okada. Okada number one. The Benedicta. So you are the policy person for the youth. Yes, I. I see. What would resonate with the youth at all? What does this? What does this manifesto promise young people? Certain thing that you would agree with me that when you look at the uh, population of Ghana, young people constitute. Yeah. Um, over the years, we've had young people involved in the policy process but most of the time what we are we have witnessed is a process where young people are consulted but young people have not really been involved in the decision making process what our party did during um, the formation of this manifesto committee was to ensure that the voice of young people was heard on the manifesto committee and so i happen to be the representative of the young people on the manifesto committee now my takeaways or the three major policies that i think um would be appealing to young people is one the promise to create a standalone ministry for youth development I think that we've had a ministry for youth and sports over the years. We've seen what efforts and what budgetary allocations have been put into youth policies and driving the youth agenda. Our promise to create that standalone ministry would ensure that the issues of young people are mainstreamed to ensure also that we prioritize policies that address the concerns of young people. For me, that is the best policy for youth development any country can put so in a place. A standalone ministry for youth. A standalone I ministry see. for youth development. Those were some of the proposals made. Yes. Something that, that I'm very passionate about. I you see. Know, um, when you have a new of sports, in the past, sports has overshadowed mm. most of the but don't forget your, your candidate says it's going to reduce the number of ministers Yes. I mean, but how do you do that mean, by, by, by breaking youth and sports into two different ministries? No, but, ministries that are going to be amalgam but he hasn't told us which ones is going to merge. Well, it will happen because it's a promise to reduce the number of ministries, reduce the number of ministers, and I, I hear no one about the 80 ministers. I don't hear any human cry. We had like 
80 marks and everyone was really? up in arms. So, so let's go back. So youth ministry for youth, what else is big for youth? We have just a few minutes, yes. To uh, respond to your initial query about the president or um, the promises to reduce the number of ministers. Yeah, he said that here. I think that, yes, I think that that should reinforce the position of the party. Nothing at all. The president is saying that I am committed to youth issues. I am committed to ensuring that youth policies are prioritized. And so, in as much as I want to reduce, so what's the, the biggest policy for youth in this manifesto? So I would I would go with the one million coders program. One million so, coders. Coders program. I, I think that we have accepted that um, the digital economy is something we have to prepare our young people for. And so the plan to train one million young people across the country to ensure that they have necessary ICT skills wow. to over the next four years to now begin to implement ideas or bring up ideas, innovations to drive this economy and this country forward. And also looking at public delivery systems. I think that that is one policy I believe wow. would achieve a lot. Fantastic. There, there will be a lot of time in the coming days to discuss this. These were just your preliminary thoughts. Yes. So, Senator Tamaklo Atiyon, thank you very much. Thank you for talking to us. We want to say a big thank you to all our viewers. We've been bringing you a special coverage of the launch of the NDC Manifesto 2020. And don't forget, on Voters Diary, we're going to break down the manifesto and compare it to other manifestos as well. And you're going to really understand all the dynamics. My name is Ben Rabele. I had a big team here, Umaru Sandamadu, and we had Anas Seidu, Kojo Ajimain, and of course the technical team, Kamaru, JB, and of course Doji, and all the team here, UPSA, led by Richard Mensa. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you very much for watching this special coverage of the Point of View and of course the NDC's manifesto launch. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.